Hello, my name is Katie Kalaitis and I'm the resident scholar at the National Hellenic Museum. And you're about to watch my conversation with Alexander Gramatikos about British Romantic literature and its role in the creation of the modern Greek state. Dr. Gramatikos holds a BA with honors from Simon Fraser University, a master's degree from the University of York in the UK, and a PhD from Carleton University. He currently works at Longora College in Vancouver, British Columbia. His 2018 book from Pelgrave Macmillan, British Romantic Literature and the Emerging Modern Greek Nation, investigates the ways in which late 18th and early 19th century British writers constructed modern Greece and its people, and how these literary engagements with Greece produced and complicated Britain's relationship with the then emerging Greek nation state. I hope you enjoy this conversation. I certainly did. First, thank you so much for coming. Um, yeah, thank you for having me, Katie. This is great. <laughs> um, I think you're, sorry, I didn't mean to step on you there. Um, I think you're our second or third um, Greek Independence Day Celebration oh. Week video. Great. So um, I'm really, I'm really glad to have you here. Could you just really briefly for our audience um, summarize what your work is on and what you sort of, what you sort of do if we were to follow you around? Uh, um, yeah, so my work um, in, in terms of my academic scholarship, I'm being yeah. teaching aside, um, my <laughs> scholarship, my book, uh, British Romantic Hellenism um, and the Emerging Modern Greek Nation. Uh, it's funny, I almost forgot my own title. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so basically, my work is looking at British Romantic writing about what would what would become the modern Greek nation. So. Um, at the at the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century, what were British writers saying about the you know the Greek about Greece the land? How were they distinguishing between what would, what was ancient Greece and who were the modern Greeks? You know, in, in terms of a kind of socio political uh, socio political matters, um, and why did that matter? Um, why did British and I think more broadly European writing about Greece? Um, matter in terms of what would then become the modern Greek nation. Um, how, how did it contribute to the liberation of Greece? I think, um, I mean, I, I had an easy starting point. I had uh, amazing scholars who came before me um, who, who wrote about who wrote about Lord Byron, for example, yeah. um, who of course was pivotal. I, I think had a, I mean, a important role at least in generating enthusiasm in Britain and Europe um uh towards towards greek liberation a, a concept that perhaps even for byron himself 20 years prior he you know uh, 15 years prior um to his death in 1824 would have not thought was a re could be a reality you know 20 years after his death uh so 20 years after his first visit excuse me becomes a reality so um how does that happen in such a you know thinking about um networks of exchange um, networks of communication in 20 years doesn't sound like a rapid, uh, uh, it, it doesn't is. sound like a uh, long period, but it is, uh, it's, it, you know, for all these things to happen in 20 years sounds like how did this happen so quickly, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. Those are some of the questions. Uh, I'm rambling a little bit, but uh, those are some of the questions no. I, 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 uh, I look at and I, you know, that I find exciting and fun. And, um, you know, yeah. And how did you land in this area? Like what, what sort of brought you personally there? It is a funny, it is a funny thing where it, you know, it does take one teacher in one moment. So um, in 2006, I was taking a romantics course at, at Simon Fraser University, um, it's about half an hour from here. From my <laughs> home. Um, I'm very close still. I, um, uh, so I took a course and we were, we were allowed to write on one of the romantic writers. Um, and I chose, uh, on the list, my, my professor, uh, Michelle Levy, who I'm still friends with. I love her. Um, uh, she, she put Shelley's Alas. And I was like, Alas, Alas is, 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 is Greece. Uh, I've, I've never heard of this poem. I need to read this poem. Um, I read this poem as a, an undergrad and I, I wrote a paper on it and I was so excited and I was like, I've, I've got a great idea. I'm going to be the first, uh, you know, I, I was an undergrad then, but I'm the first <laughs> scholar of romanticism who's going to write on the romantics in Greece. 
Um, I went to the library and I quickly realized that many scholars had done this um, uh, and that I was not going to be the first. Uh, and it is, it's an odd pair, uh, actually, an odd, now that I think about it, kind of a parallelism to all of these romantics in the 18th, 19th century wanting to be the first to discover Greece in a weird way. Yeah. Yeah, uh, no, yeah. So um, yeah, that's how I came to it. And I, um, then I, as a, a master's student, I was still interested in writing about Shelley and Byron. Um, and then I wanted to do something that was, I wanted to have an intervention in the field, but something that was of course unique. And so um, I'm, I might be going a little bit, uh, uh, you know, tell, you can tell me to stop whenever. No, uh, we, this is what we love. I wanted to give I wanted to give some diversity to um, what it meant, what romantic Hellenism meant, right? Um, and I read, you know, uh, I've been thinking about these questions, but Noah Comet has uh, a, a great book about uh, British romantic uh, writers, but uh, female British romantic uh, writers and and Greece. Um, and and Noah Comet talks about how Greek, uh, so excuse me, British romantic writers for women their relationship with ancient Greece is a little bit, um, is a little bit different. Um, the way that they mediate the past, the way that they, so for example, um, you know, classicism, neoclassicism is about celebrating, you know, the arts and the democracy of, you know, um, the liberty that was ancient Greece. It's a very idealistic notion. Uh, and, and female writers were in a position to be like, it wasn't all, you know, it wasn't all rosy for us, even in ancient Greek times. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't this paradise that male writers make it out to be. I thought that was super interesting the way that, uh, uh, I'm calling him Noah, I like his, uh, Noah Comet, um, wrote about that. And I, I was, I want to do something similar. I want to look at um, the kind of plurality of voices around modern Greece. I want to look at those voices that aren't uh, necessarily philhellenic either, right? Those voices that are a bit more skeptical about about Greece, uh, skeptical about the ancient Greek uh, tradition. You're skeptical about modern Greeks and their ability to have to have a, a nation of their own. So those are the kinds of questions um, that I was that I still excite me, that I still uh, that I still think about. So, <laughs> and those are the questions I want you to talk about here today. Oh, okay. um, but, but just really before we dive into those, because that's uh, when I was reading your, your excellent book and there is going to be a link in the bio. Um, you. Cairo, you will put a link in the bio. We break the fourth wall here all, all the time. So we address Cairo yeah, yeah. at all times. Um, but Cairo will put the link in the bio. Before we, before we jump into that, because I, I, have, I have so much I want to talk to you about that. It was, it was absolutely excellent. And I mean that I do I have to do a lot of reading. Um, as you, I mean, that's the kind of work we do. Like, you don't yeah. go study literature unless you want to read a lot, but you're really excellent, excellent read. Um, but really briefly, just for our, sort of our lay audience, um, could you just give a brief kind of introduction to British Bell Hellenism, like maybe like 10 minutes, kind of talk about what's going on in Britain with relation to, to classical Greece in the late 18th, early 19th century. Yeah, sure. So um, I think even going further back than the 18th or, uh, the, or the late 18th century, um, we have, and I think it, it's funny, we talk, and, and this is me as well, where um, I'm writing a book about British romantic Hellenism, and I kind of am looking through, you know, this very, it, I'm looking in a specific nationalistic way. And, and in many ways, um, classicism and neoclassicism um, isn't uh, to be isn't to be uh, examined. It, it didn't develop in ways that were narrow, and and I, I know that has to do with I think um, the, the limitations of of, of 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 disciplinary limitations. Basically, I'm a British yeah. romantic Hellenist, right? Um, but it, it's very much a, I would say a European at the very least a European kind of um, concept, and I think of you know on the top of uh, on top of my head like someone like uh, uh, Johann Joachim Winckelmann. Um, who, who in the 19, in the, excuse me, the 1750s and 1760s is writing about the histories of ancient art, and he's um, and he is looking basic, specifically at aesthetics, um, um, and he uh, actually and, and he's looking at actually Roman models of uh, uh, of of ancient Greek art, right, and making assessments on that art. Um, and, and then we have, uh, it's James Stewart and, and Nicholas Revit, who then, um, it's, the, it's the Antiquities of Athens and Other Monuments of Greece in, the, in, the, in 1762 is when they first published it. And these are, they're, they're British, well, James, uh, 
Stuart is Scottish. Um, the name like Stuart. Uh, yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, correct. Um, and so they are, they are actually, they've gone to Greece, unlike Winkelmann, uh, and they, um, and they are, uh, look, they are making sketches of ancient monuments and buildings. So um, and even you thinking about the, the mid 18th century, they, you are generating a lot of interest in, in, in Greece, ancient Greece, ancient Greek monuments, but you're, but both, you know, Winkelmann and, and, and Stuart and Revit, they are thinking about the Greek topos, right? The Greek landscape itself. And that's kind of generates this, this, this desire, um, this, this flowing in of, 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 of tourists from Europe to actually go and visit the land. Of course, tourists of means, we're not, you know, we're not in a, a, a moment of mass tourism yet. And so um, we have uh, all of these, you know, we have these, these, these writers, these, 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 I don't know, uh, writers and, and, you know, ar architects, uh, ar artists, um, contributing to kind of a, an interest in, in, in Greece itself. And then I, for me, I think it, it, the way that uh, neoclassicism kind of, uh, the, this rejuvenated um, interest in Greece actually fuels British Hellenism, uh, Philhellenism, right? Um, this, this in, and, and I think, I think that's born out even in, in today, in, well, I was gonna say 1821, no, uh, 2021, uh, where we still think of Greece in these very uh, this kind of binary ways or the kind of dichotomy of ancient and modern, um, or, or we think of them as united. And I think that a, a lot of writers uh, were thinking in those ways too, and that's what generated interest in, in British Philhellenism. Um, so, yeah, I, I, and then we have we have travelers. I think the most famous, of course, uh, in 1812, he publishes *Child Harold's Pilgrimage*. Lord Byron, um, but there are other travelers um, at the same time as him. And I mean, I, I don't know. If you want me to talk? I can talk about this later. But Byron is uh, in competition with those writers, and he knows. So there are people like John Galt, um, who's also in Greece at the same time, and and Byron's. Uh, you know, I I, I find Byron. <laughs> hilarious in the way that he he wants to get his travelogue out first and he wants to be, he wants to be the authority on modern Greece which I find very interesting and Romaic uh, specifically um I'm trying to think of um other you know other things to say yeah um no, no, yeah. no I think that's fascinating I think that's and that's one of the things that we tried to I, I think I maybe beat the dead horse around here a little too much about is this dichotomy right this sort yeah. of two two greeks that yes. emerge in the in the western mind and, yeah. and we can have a conversation about is greece what but the idea that you know yeah. so modern greece right. or ottoman <laughs> greece is not western right in, yeah and then you have the sort of ancestor of the west in, in ancient greece i think that um um, that kind of dichotomy is something that we see, I guess the only word is dichotomy, um, yeah. that dichotomy, that tension yeah, um, yeah. Nice is playing. interesting. Yeah, I think what interested Byron about Greece is, um, it, and it's funny because we, and we think about um, Byron's travels to Greece in 1823-24, it's his second trip, um, and we think of him as, you know, um, well, I guess, I say we think of him, maybe some don't, but he was, you know, uh, Roderick Beaton in, in his book, Byron's War, I think 2013 now, I can't believe it's that, anyway, uh, <laughs> the years go by, uh, but it, he beautifully outlines Byron as a pragmatic thinker, because uh, there's been, um, there's this idea that Byron kind of was wishy-washy, that he was, um, you know, wasn't really thinking what he was doing, but actually, at all steps of the process, Byron was thinking pragmatically of how he could help the Greek cause. And so um, during that time, um, and this is Beaton's argument, is that he's trying to bring Greece within a kind of European or we might say Western sphere of influence, right? Trying to make Greece into an, a, a modern European nation. Um, and for me, that's a little bit different than what Byron is doing in his first trip in between 1809 to 1811, um, and he lived in Athens 1810 on, onwards for about yeah, six to eight months. Um, uh, he, Byron at that time, um, he loves that Greece, that modern Greece uh, is different. He likes the, he likes the, he likes the fact that 
um, you know, I would say he, you know, he writes the Eastern Tales a few years later. He he orientalizes modern Greece and he sees it as you know part of the Ottoman Empire, which it is part of the Ottoman Empire. Um, and then he talks about, you know, he's he, one of the things that Byron is very invested in is is Romaic language, uh, um, which reads to you know Roman, right? Which yeah. leads us to questions of uh, Byzantium and that that tricky middle history of Greece and what does that all mean, right? Um, um, and so that's what interests Byron, the otherness of Greece. But that's funny because w w when we think about questions of Greece as West or East or or neither or both or what, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, yeah. yeah, or everything and nothing. But um, yeah, so these are the kinds of and, and, and I think I'm babbling a little bit because these these questions get me babbling a little bit because yeah. there's so many dimensions. <laughs> no, you're excited. This is what I mean. I mean, I'm I'm really fascinated by this. Is we we should go get a drink sometime when we're allowed to go get drinks. Yeah, exactly. um, because <laughs> this is a question that that I'm really um, sort of interested in as well. Is this sort of you know how do you negotiate or how did how did outsiders at some level and then Greeks sort of responding to it right? I think you see Greek thinkers mm -hmm. um, yeah. from the Enlightenment on certainly yeah, sort of absolutely. responding to it. Mm -hmm. um, but how do you negotiate this, you know, sort of classical Greece and all the baggage, certainly by the 19th century that has, um, and then yeah. you have, you have the Byzantines, which are kind of, you know, yeah. interesting. And then you have modern Greek, you know, you, you go to, you go to, you go to fight with Pericles and you show up and somebody's papu is there, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a, I think that's a really interesting, it is interesting. Um, Yes, yeah, it's a sort of fascinating topic. So, um, and I, I love to hear you you sort of talk about it there. Um, one of the things you you talk about, I think, really really well in, in your book, um, which once again I recommend everyone everyone read, is the sort of diversity of opinions that are circulating. Um, we had um, Maureen Santinelli on. Um, I don't know if she's going to be before or after you in in the real world. Um, <laughs> But um, she, she writes about American Philhellenism um, cool. around the same time as a, as a historian, not so much a, a literary scholar. Cool. But you know, one thing she talks about is this real unifying effect the Greek cause had in America, where even um, where, you know, the slavery was starting to tear the nation apart. 1820 is, is the, the um, Great Compromise. And um, yet everybody was sort of on the side of the Greeks, right? Yeah. Um, so I think, I think that, you know, your book really describes the sort of kind of the ways in which the Greek cause highlighted these differences yeah. um, in British society. I'd, I'd love to hear you talk more about that. I'm going to first jump in and say uh, American Philhellenism is such a, I've only read a couple of uh, articles and I, I don't know enough. Um, and that wasn't your question anyway, but, <laughs> um, but I, uh, you know, just on a personal side, I would love to learn more. And I do love that idea of um, there was so much support and monetary support being sent from, from USA, from America to Greece during the, um, the Greek war of independence. So you do talk very well and, in a very interesting way about the sort of diversity of opinions. And I'd love for you to talk more about that for our audience. Yeah, so um, there was not a consensus in Europe and I think especially in Britain about um, the Greeks, the modern Greeks or the need for uh, a Greek liberation. Um, and I think that took a lot of work, right? So we have, um, we have like the London Philhellenic Committee um, run by uh, John, John Bowring, um, and uh, lots of the people Byron knew were part of the group, including John Cam Hobhouse, who he went to Greece with the first time uh, in 1809 to 1810. Uh, by, uh, Hobhouse left in 1810. Um, and so, uh, you know, there, wa there was a lot of debate around, you know, first off, it, it's, it is funny how, um, I think we th have to think of things globally, but we have to think about things locally. Like, um, you know, on the day to day, just like I think other peoples, there, uh, you know, um, in thinking about, you know, access to liter, access to first off, access to news, access to literacy. Um, 
were a lot of British people at on the day to day level thinking about modern Greek liberation? <laughs> Not really. They were thinking about how to feed their families, and I yeah. and that, that's a that's a point that you know Nisia emphasized. <laughs> um, but there were there were a lot of people, especially you know writers, um, you know uh, the thinkers of the period, who were thinking around questions of of modern Greece, and there were travelers who went. So. Um, Thomas Hope, I, I find his, his novel Anastasius, uh, published in 1819, such a fascinating, um, such a fascinating read uh, in terms of he presents us with this, you know, this, this Greek character who's conniving, right? So he's, he is, he is playing up the trope of the tricky, the slippery, conniving wow. Greek, right? And you're like, Ugh. Um, but, but, um, but the, he, but I think there's a lot of love for this character as well. I think he 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 sees him as resourceful. He sees, um, he sees this character operating within an Ottoman world that he needs to negotiate. And you know he wants to move up. He doesn't want to be you know he doesn't want to be at the the the, the lowest section of, of society. He wants to move up. And he's how do I move up in the society? At one point he actually converts to Islam. Uh, he becomes Salim in the novel. And so we can see questions of like uh, questions of identity. We can see questions of, of what a and I, I personally you know even though he plays yeah. up that kind of trope it's it's I think it's heartfelt in the sense that he's like well this is what this uh, you know yeah. Anastasius needs to do to to operate within this world right but that said it is in terms of the, the question that you asked about diversity of opinion Thomas Hope isn't of the opinion that that the modern Greeks are like the ancient Greeks you know that kind of you know idealized you know that kind of you know um, yeah this idealistic version of of of, of Greece right and yeah. so um, in, in my book, I, I pair Anastasius with uh, Sidney Owenson's Lady Morgan's uh, Ida of Athens, um, which, you know, the, the heroine is very much in the kind of classical mode. She even poses like, uh, like, <laughs> in, like classical portraiture. She dances the ancient Greek dances and, and, and goes, and it's, it, it's this very it, it, over the top, like this over-determined need to connect modern and ancient Greece. And it is interesting because writers like Owenson know that in you know this and she's writes this before Byron I think uh, I'm trying 1809 um she knows that if Greek liberation is going to happen the currency that modern Greeks have is their ancient past so she knows that the social capital the kind of uh, cultural yeah. capital uh that that Greeks have even in 1809 is their ancient past because that's what matters to Britain and Europe and so it's, I, I think it's a, a brilliant uh it's a you know over the top for sure uh out of Athens but I think it's a brilliant um knowledge of of how cultural capital works and how it works for Greeks and, you know, I would say how it continues to work for Greeks to some degree, even in 2021, right? So, I mean, what, I mean, if we're being, you know, frank, I think, you know, Greece's tourists, I mean, obviously Greece is beautiful and warm and all of those okay, things, yeah, absolutely. but there's lots of places in the Mediterranean and in the world that are beautiful and warm. Yeah. And Gre I think Greece is a tourist destination destination which is a huge part of the greek economy if we're being you know very yeah. frank yeah. yeah um you know that is about curing that ancient past like it's just at the kind of most basic level um it's it's funny because i think in ways you know and i speak only for myself you, you yeah. could be skeptical about how that past is used or yeah. or whether that's even whether it holds currency today but um you know I had a friend who went to Athens three years ago and he was like it was amazing going up to the Acropolis and the Parthenon and seeing like this is where western civilization began and I, I know I, there's a bit of a chuckle but it's also it's interesting how and that's a that's a taught habit too I don't think that was just naturally we think of oh there's where western civilization it, it is taught <laughs> Um, how, how much currency that holds, and honestly, I you know. I think of twenty twenty one. What do we do with that? How do we, um, how do we, how do we think and rethink what the ancient past means for Greece today, and how that can be um, used in ways that are, you know, beneficial or, you know, um, might be thinking a little I mean, bit aloud now. But <laughs> no, 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 I don't, and I don't want to put you on the spot. But and I wasn't going to ask you this, and if you we once again, um, 
you know, I'm, I'm a classicist by training. And so there's, there's a huge debate that's been going on certainly much longer than this, but right now it's kind of heated up because the New York magazine published this article about, you know, the future of classics and classics yeah. and race. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things I think maybe, and as I hear you talk, I, I, you're kind of stirring these thoughts, yeah. you know, I, I think modern Greeks have a real, and the way modern Greece, Greeks and Greece has been portrayed in the West and has portrayed itself to the, to the West mm -hmm. um, and to the world. I mean, those ad campaigns are meant for rich Chinese tourists to come to, by the way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like, I think the... The, that is a part of this conversation that in some ways is missing and might have, yeah. um, you know, as we think through that, that ancient past, the constructed ancient past and all the, the complexity yeah. of that, I wonder what, I don't expect you to have an answer to this, I'm just thinking out loud too, but, you know, I wonder what role the, the history of modern Greece and it, the representation of modern Greeks has to play in that. I think that's the most fascinating part. I, I like the word construction um, uh, in terms of, you know, the modern Greek nation being, you know, since, you know, 1821 and this kind of construction. And I would say work into that, right? You know, I, I don't have the answers. I'm one person speaking. So that, you know, let's, you know, um, but, you know, the fact that there were constructions, but there are, um, in order to, construct at that time a kind of, um, you know, this image of a classical Greece. Remember that um, up at the Acropolis, there were other buildings, uh, you know, a, a, a other periods in antiquity of, of the Middle Ages, of, of, of the, you know, what we call Byzantium, although that's not the right term, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, during the Roman period. Um, uh, and, and so um, all of these were kind of, not kind of, they were taken down to kind of give this idea of a, of a classical Acropolis, right? Um, and and so, uh, in terms of the word again, we used your word construction. I think that construction is fascinating, and that construction can be fascinating to people, other people, say tourists, right? Mm -hmm. How is how is national identity, or how is how is identity constructed at the period, and and um, how did Greeks react to that, right? How did did they think, you know, what did they think about these constructions as well? I think that that's an interesting question, and then another. Um, I've always thought of, you know, and perhaps I'm getting into tricky territory, but no, I think the fact that Greece can be seen as West or East and, and what those terms even mean, I mean, we'd have to talk for a very long time, <laughs> but I, 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 I love the idea of, of um, um, you know, I'm going to use the term orientalizing, but orientalizing in terms of like seeing different paths, seeing, you know, understanding before, you know, say Western intervention uh, in, the, in the 19th century, what do other Greek pasts look like and why is it important that we remember them as well? And so I don't have all the answers and I'm certainly not the, the one to, to only do that work. I mean, that's what's so great about uh, uh, scholarship. There are a lot of us talking to each other. Um, but yeah, I, I, find, I find the idea of these constructions super interesting and super important as well as we, as we, you know, we think about what Greece is. It's, it's, Greece isn't, uh, you know, uh, the Hellenic isn't something that's static and, and it's, it's always ever changing. I think that's, that's so cool. Yeah. yeah. No, I think that's, I think that's, I mean, one of the things that I think is important to remember too, just, you know, contextually about the 19th century is there's lots of countries that are on nation building projects, Absolutely. right? Yeah. I mean, and, and, and people forget, but Greece is actually one of the earlier European <laughs> nations. <laughs> No, it's, uh, it's, it is, it's quite early in the process of nation building. And so um, exactly like you say, I think that's a great point, Katie, of like putting Greece's nation building into relation to other European or non-European forms of, 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 of national identity and what that looks like. I think that's so interesting. Yeah, no, I think, I think it's important. I mean, it is important to remember, I think, um, because the nation state seems so natural to us, right? Like, it just seems like, like, of, of course, like, of course, yeah. there's a united Germany, like, um, yeah. 1871, like, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. And I mean, you know, Italy, like, Italy is a country, like, obviously, like, not, not obviously, like, 1860. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that, you know, I think that because it seems so natural to us, it's, it's easy to dismiss the sort of, First, you know, I, I, or the, it's easy to dismiss the sort of work that went into constructing those. And then Absolutely. when you do think about the work, 
I think it's people tend to think in terms of like geopolitics, right? So like, oh, the collapse of this empire, that empire. Um, Mm -hmm. But really what, you know, you know, one thing you do, I think really brilliantly in your book, and and of course there's there's a lot of scholarship around this, but you know, is the the sort of cultural work that goes into building a nation, Yeah. right? And you have to, I think probably you have to create some sort of past, right? You can't just be like, especially if you're claiming there's something, I mean, the romantics and this idea of like the nation and the people and like, you can't just be like, yeah, this is a sacred holy thing that started 10 minutes ago. Um, exactly. Yep. I mean, <laughs> I agree with that. I think, I think it, there's something comforting about the fact that politics or geopolitics, um, that those who, you know, the, the politicians who run the show um, can be influenced by the larger culture that they operate in, in which they, you know, serve. Um, I, you know, and I'm thinking about, you know, even uh, George Canning, who's a foreign secretary um, at the time that of the Greek liberation, he has to tread very carefully. Uh, even though he sees that there's a London Philhellenic Com- um, uh, committee, even though he sees Lord Byron going, even though George Canning himself um, is a Philhellen, um, uh, he he still has to understand that you know he he has um, he has links and he has partnerships with the Ottoman Empire, and he cannot tread upon the, he, ha- he has to tread carefully. Basically, he can't you know stomp upon those in you know to help these you know the modern people. Why wouldn't you help modern Greeks? Well, there's a lot of a lot of stuff that's going on, but I think you know um, you know in their ways and the ways that are not entirely measurable but these poems that come out these um you know Lord Byron of course his works um these dramas that are being staged on the legitimate theaters um Jury Lane and Covent Garden in 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 London um uh, about you know modern Greek liberation uh these kinds of you know and you know they are you know highly problematic demonizing someone like Ali Pasha for example um uh, but these are the these are the these are the things that they they do trickle through the kind of the the social matrix so to speak and and they 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 create change in in ways that aren't exactly measurable you can measure in ways Lord Byron because he's, he's such a huge cult celebrity figure but um yeah I think culture is you know as, as we'd all agree culture is is very important to these movements you know, I think, I think it's an absolute, um, this sort of, yeah, I think it's a really interesting um, sort of tension, I guess. And it, this, you know, how do we understand how this actually happened? And I think Greece is maybe, I mean, obviously, you know, um, our last names kind of reveal our bias maybe yeah. a little bit, but um, they don't hand out that many vows to just anybody. That's right. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you have to you have to earn it. Um, but I think that, um, you know, I think I think it's important to kind of think through these things. And you do a really brilliant job of oh, sort of okay. presenting oh. the material. Um, the link is in the bio. I'm I'm respectful of your time. We have a little tradition. It's not really a tradition. Cairo and I are trying to make it to a tradition um, here at the National Hellenic Museum. So James Pivot was the host of Inside the Actors Studio. Um, he he took these questions. These are kind of related to the Proust questionnaire. So sure. he kind of adapted them to the American television viewing audience of A okay. and E. So like you know, make yeah. make your nuanced adjustments. Um, okay. Make your nuanced adjustments there. Um, so these are rapid fire questions. Yeah, you can't. There are no wrong answers. Okay. Also, remember, we're editing this, so if you yeah, want to yeah. do it again. <laughs> okay. Okay, ready? Yeah. Alexander Grammatikos, what is your favorite word? Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> kalos. Uh, uh, I give a, a, a Greek word, actually, because it means something different in ancient and modern Greek. So I think it's... it's uh, I find that interesting. I that was that was anyway. That's good. That's a good answer. What's your least favorite word? We've had committee meeting used already, just so you know. <laughs> um, can't. Can't. Oh, good. Um, what sound or noise do you love? 
what sound or noise do I, oh gosh. Um, is, can it be music? Sure, of course. Yeah. Music, hip -hop, there you go. Hip hop and r &B. What sound or noise do you hate? I drown them out. So I, I'm, <laughs> I, there could be a drilling sound and as, as long as I'm working and doing something, I don't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, okay, I'm losing. What profession, other than your own, would you like to attempt? Film critic. That's <laughs> <laughs> you know there might be a future there. Um, if you were reincarnated as some other plant or animal, what would it be? I think a dog. Okay. <laughs> They're great. Dogs are great. Okay, last question. And then you're then you're free. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? You tried your best. Oh, that's really sweet. Thank you so, so very much. You are absolutely brilliant. Um, and come back anytime. Thank you. That's very kind of you to have me. I this is this is a lot of fun. I, I was definitely nervous, but it was a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, good, 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 good. We don't we we want you to have fun here. Yeah. So thank you so much. Um, the links to Professor Grammatic Close's book are in the bio. Um, thank you so much, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye. Thank you.